The guest is Leela Brown, who is a member of the tra uh, animal tracking group Cascadia Wild, local here in Portland. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the organization does and talk a little bit about uh, some of the peripheral things that, th that they do. They just led a hike with Bark, and I've talked about Bark on this program many times. I'm a member of that. And Bark led their monthly hike, on the, which they do on the second Sunday of every month. And they co-led the group with, with Leela and a couple of her, her uh, people are involved in the program as well. And it was a great hike. So welcome to the program, Leela. Thanks. All right. We're going to uh, just move ahead with this. And if any questions, uh, you have a question right uh, off the bat. How do you get to the Facebook thing? I'm not a Facebook expert. Uh, Are you so on maybe Facebook? Someone, maybe someone out there isn't as That's true. any better than I am. So That's how true. do you get to that? So you just go to Facebook, okay. the website, and you just type in Cascadia Wild. Okay. And but you got to be a, you got to be registered on Facebook. Yeah, you, you got to have, have an account with them. Have okay. an account on Facebook, which is simple. But you can also go okay. to our website. It's okay. CascadiaWild.org. Okay. Dot org. okay. Right, and I have your I have your name up there with your with your uh, website on there, and, and that goes to it. Uh, the website will connect to our calendars and things. We've been getting some volunteer help updating our web page right now, so um, it'll be better really soon. You can also contact us okay. at info at cascadiawild.org. Okay. And that's a good way to get on the mailing list to find out about events and programs that we put on. Is that all you want? Okay. okay. All right. So what is Cascadia Wild? How long has it been in, in operation? So Cascadia Wild uh, is a very small nonprofit. It started out, I'm pretty sure it started out by request of the Forest Service to start teaching, tracking, and getting people monitoring the animal tracks on Mount Hood for rare carnivores. Mm -hmm. um, the head biologist, Alan Dyke, was pretty sure, is pretty sure that there are wolverines passing through our mountain, Mount Hood. That was one of the clips I made up was that talk about that. So, huh. so actually the tracking project that we took you guys out the other day, that tracking project is called the Wolverine Tracking Project. So you have more than one, you got different projects then that you're working uh, on. That is our winter tracking project. Oh, okay. And, and we, we do monitor all the animals that we find. We, we take a tally of prey species. But um, the real target is the weasel family, which wolverines are part of. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't been documented until, the, until around 1980 that was the last confirmed documented sighting of a wolverine, which was crossing I-84. Um, mm -hmm. But since then, wolverines have been moving back into our area, and there's a lot of activity in the Wallawas. Uh, that there's a researcher working there. She's hoping to find family groups, but find breeding females this winter. But w so we document all. We have certain target species, including wolverines, but we document all the animal tracks that we find. All right. Now, why is it important to do that? So it's really interesting animal tracking because you don't have to see the animal. The normal way to monitor what animals are in a particular place, um, well, one of the ways is with cameras but that can be very expensive, and we do that as well, hoping to find wolverines in summer. Time-lapse cameras or? Yeah, well, with motion sensor cameras. Motion sensor, yeah. And um, oh. so in the winter, a really good way to keep track of what animals are walking around is you can look at the tracks. Yeah. Depending on the snow, if an animal comes by, it will leave tracks, and you can see it for a good period of time. And so... It's, it's actually a lot cheaper, and um, because we're all volunteers, and we're trained volunteers, um, it's, it's fairly, it's very cost effective for the, the Forest Service to use us. They, they have a predictable level of training that we have, so they know that if we find something, we're documenting it, we're taking pictures, and that they can generally trust our, our data. And that's what we hope. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember Grady was talking to you about during the hike. He was mentioning how the Forest Service had, unbeknown to you, they had used some of your information in a certain way. You remember that? Yeah, conversation? that's right. Um, so that was the first we'd heard of it. But Grady said that 
they had actually saved a parcel of forest from, which is national forest, public, li public land. They prevented right. logging because we had found Martin where they didn't know there were Martin, Pine Martin yeah. is in, that's in the same family as, as Wolverines, the mm -hmm. Mustelid family. And what is, what is that? Mustelids, it's the, it's the animal Martin. family that has, oh, Pine Martin. They, they're like, uh, in between a little weasel and a, uh, they kind of look like small otters, I guess. Oh, okay. But they walk around on land. They're, they're considered an indicator species of healthy forests and, we actually document, that's one of our target species, and we mm -hmm. document those fairly regularly over the winter. That was something I was going to ask, because I know there's, there's keystone species and indicator species, and, you know, indicator species is like the spotted owl. Yeah, so we're, we're still learning. Mostly what I do is the tracking part, and this year we're learning a lot more about the management, what happens with our data once we write it down and give it to the biologist for the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. um, but I know some of that, you know, like a keystone species is an animal like salmon or wolves that affect at many, many different species that basically the whole food chain relies on. Oh. And an indicator species is an animal that needs certain stuff in the woods. But, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a lay person. And um, I practice tracking, so I, mm. I see what's on the ground, you know. But um, you provide, and you, you go out there and get data that the people that do know, the scientists do know, can make interpretations. Yeah, exactly. So um, Cascadia Wild, in the winter, we do tracking with people. But at the same time, while we're out on our tracking trips, and some of them are overnight snow camping trips, mm. we're teaching people survival, we're teaching plant uses, so a lot of, pretty much all of our trip leaders are all around naturalists. So it's not just, we have a really interesting balance of science and then these other less tangible skills. Um, and really our emphasis is on getting people out to the woods and getting people enjoying being in nature, which is so close. And if you live in the city, it can be really hard to get out there. But so we have this like community and science and like skills balance so it's really fun mm -hmm. you, you know i was gonna say something uh, i don't know who all saw this but uh, this wolf that they were tracking yeah the one that went down to california is putting a lot of interest can indeed put a lot of interest into what you're talking about because i I, no one was aware that they were tracking this wolf in the same way with a camera and then here they get this great picture of him down there and well they, they had a collar on him or something uh, I I'm I remember seeing the picture in the newspaper I think it might have been a hunter just set up his camera, a motion his cam camera. camera. Mm -hmm. but um, we use similar cameras to that to the one that took the picture of the wolf and there's been some suggestion that we might need to start looking out for wolf tracks on Mount Hood as well. Do you put those things, uh, well, I, I know the dogs have them in the back that, that uh, to identify them. Do the chips? Yeah, and, and I wonder if that wolf had that. I think it did. But could, I'm would not you a, I'm do not that a, to some of these animals? Well, I don't know how they would track. It would depend on the study. You've got to catch one first. And then you got to <laughs> put this in their body somehow. Right, but, but honestly, the offspring won't have it. One cool no. thing about no. animal tracking is you don't necessarily need to ch be chipping every animal that comes by. Right. And what no, we're no. doing is, is not as much a study, but it's more getting a general sense of what's present. Okay. We're not saying which individual animals are present, but we're saying which species have crossed this way since yeah. it snowed basically okay. and so it's it's much more of like a preliminary step so that if and this has happened if someone wanted to do a study on pine martens then they okay. could sit at, look at our data look at our maps and say where are pine martens on mount hood where would be a good spot for me to go and then they would study the individual animals or the family groups so so citizen science can be a little like more general because mm -hmm we're not out there every single day. It would be hard for us to identify individual animals if okay. we're going out on weekends only, you know? Okay. So okay. It, it's, 
you know, it's something, but, but at the same time, we have a lot of people going out. We have about 60 participants this winter and then over a dozen leaders of the trips. Okay. And, and so those are the trained people who lead the groups. And that's a lot of eyes to yep, be right. up there. I was just saying the possibility of catching, what do they do? They uh, put these sleep uh, bullets uh, in there so that they can... Tranquilizers? Put, tranquilizers. And then put this identification thing in. I'm just wondering if that's something they might do or, or so something. So I'm a geek about wolverines. And one oh, really cool okay. thing, uh, the woman in the Wallawas who's studying them she figured out, and she's, I, be, I bet she's one of the leading Wolverine researchers in the West, because okay. she has been doing it for, I'm pretty sure, over 20 years. And mm. she figured out that each individual animal has a unique pattern on their, of the fur on their chest. Oh, okay. And so when she uses a motion sensor camera, she has a special bait thing that gets them to show this, this yeah. area. Mm. And so she doesn't have to microchip them because she can see... She can identify them, okay. and she actually tested it between... She tested it with uh, captive wolverines okay. and proved that she was able to identify those animals, which was really cool. With, with, with people going and looking around like that, does that cause them to avoid people, or do they just... Do you hope they're just not aware that you're around? That's a really good question. Um, it's hard to say what, you know, every single impact that we have, okay. but okay. I believe that because we're walking on we're not we're not necessarily bushwhacking through the wilderness like uh we tend to walk roads we tend to walk okay habited okay. trails i can okay. talk a little more about animal tracking specifically because that's the really special thing about what we do is the not necessarily i mean the science is very intriguing mm -hmm. but i feel like the, the art of animal tracking and the science of animal tracking is really unique. There are not very many other activities we can do that connect us so much to what it is to be human. And it mm -hmm. sounds really like philosophical, but yeah. um, it's really what, what I experience as a tracker and what I, what I discuss with my fellow trackers. And um, every time I see somebody get, just starting to get into it, uh, you really see people start to just um, really feel what it is to be human through this act. Because mm -hmm. looking at animal tracks, um, a lot of people think that that is one of the ways our brain developed. Like we have these really big frontal lobes and um we don't know what to do with them <laughs> well we're still we're a pretty new animal mm -hmm, and sure. uh so tracking is this thing that's a, it's a symbolic act and it's hard to say what it is to be human what makes us different as an animal but thinking about the past thinking about the future is one of the things that seems like it might be something that sets us apart from other animals, that we do that a lot more. We think symbolically, we use metaphor. And I believe, and I've read other people who think this, that tracking is what got us there. Tracking is what helped us develop our big old brains. Mm -hmm. um, Hunters and gatherers. Well, well, people who hunted, yeah. So you, yeah. you use animal tracks, you can use animal yeah, tracks to find where animals are going to water, that primitive yeah. people could yeah. use animal tracks for all sorts of things and think of sign in that way but um we're still in the same bodies as those primitive people our bodies haven't changed in mm, we, right. we've our, our societies changed really rapidly but our bodies are the same and our brains are the same mm -hmm. so animal tracking is super satisfying it really you know mm -hmm. one thing that struck me about that is is well, you're dealing with something that could have passed by oh, a few days ago hours ago whatever but at the same time, your knowledge about that animal really brings you into inti intimate relationship with him, even though that's, he might have been gone for a week. That's exactly right. Mm. Did you get that from us going out on the mountain the other day? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. You, really, you really, one thing that trackers describe is either being able to see the animal as they move, like you look at the trail and that you can picture that animal's body walking past you, or thinking like the animal that mm -hmm. you put yourself in the place of that animal i forget the terminology but one but one person said that i forget one of the other uh, leaders said that you know you, you you try to visualize 
the size of it, the length of it, the, yeah. the length of the legs, even the musculature and all. Right. You're able to you're able to depict all that, portray all that, whatever the word would be, from just not only just the tracks, but the re repetition of the tracks and the relationship between the tracks and the environment and all these components that, uh, yeah. uh, you know, like I was saying, it's it's not uh, CSI, it's TSI. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of it that way. Um, that's right, and that's why, one of the reasons why the trip leaders in Cascadia Wild are expected and trained to be better naturalists than they would normally be, that they learn the plants, they learn the trees, they, we have to know the tree species in order to even fill out our surveys, but we also need to know about the animals, what they want to eat, what they're, who eats them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, predation. And, and that's actually a big part of animal tracking. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to try this one last time. Bunnies um, or snowshoe hares, probably what's here, are my usually cat. Yeah. Uh, land more with their front feet like this. Mm -hmm. So it's where the you see the two small feet yeah. behind. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Those are actually the front feet. It's going like this. So it's doing the Scooby Doo. Yeah, and his hind feet are <laughs> la landing there. And uh, the rabbits usually land more like this. The front feet. Would oh, okay. Be oh. More of a line like this. Would as they be a little to heavier too? To make it mm -hmm. And it would be. The snowshoe hair are actually pretty big. They're, they're hind feet yeah. sometimes. You, wow. One foot, the hind yeah, foot's like that big. Like this big. We hung out with the lady who's doing wolverine research in the Wallawas, mm -hmm. and she's getting wolverines on her motion sensor cameras, and she's been studying wolverines for like over 20 years. Wow. And she said, wolverines don't like rotten meat. Mm -hmm. And so they live in those high elevations so that they can make deer kills and then cache that meat and then it doesn't go bad. Refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they need that snow for cover, for shelter, for denning. And they can pass through areas like this, but that they much prefer like those super steep, avalanche prone, above mm -hmm. timberline spots. <laughs> and Mount, Mount Hood's almost not even tall enough for, to provide year-round uh -huh. stuff like that for them. So they do really well in the Wallawas and on Adams mm. and things like that. But. Well, there's less people there, too, than the, Mount Hood. Mount so wolverines <coughs> aren't as shy as people formerly thought also. That's another piece of fairly new evidence for us mm. as an organization who's been looking for wolverines. We trusted everybody else and thought they were shy animals, but they're not as shy. There are wolverines that will den right next to big freeways in, in like near Yosemite in the Sierras. Mm. So, so there's, you know, you really have to, that's why when you're tracking, you really have to suspend a lot of those no, precon preconceptions mm. about what mm. an animal will do, where it will be, because the evidence is on the ground, you know. It's not as much from common, you know, what everyone knows. So They're the top of the food chain pretty much, aren't they? Yeah, as far as I know, except for the young ones, they don't have predators and most of their deaths are from other things. But, it, you know, we've been, the, the actual wolverine research is getting better and we've finally made contact with people who actually know that well, 20 stuff. 20 years is a long time and the, it's a recent she, study. She actually raised wolverines in captivity. Mm. So she got to observe them from that level too, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the crew. They had to they had to wire in another deck, and they went through a lot of trouble. The crew and the and the, and the help from the facility. Yeah. So we got a couple more clips, and we'll just move forward with that. But uh, it's funny you would mention the wolverines because that was one of the clips. I didn't realize that you you folks were that focused on that particular breed. Yeah, it, in a way, it kind of gets us a goal. Mm -hmm. And we, 
I've been involved for six years and we've never seen sign of Wolverine. Mm-hmm. So it's to some people it's a little bit like fantasy or something, but um, but they're really telling us that it's a possibility. So we just keep that goal and keep looking for them, you know. And mm-hmm. we we kind of joke about it, like, oh yeah, we saw some three Wolverines, three Wolverine tracks today, but. Um, someday we're going to find them. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I don't know if it was included in that, but like you were saying there that uh, in Yellowstone, they found dens near highways and things. Something, That's right. You said something and, like and, that anyway. In Yosemite. Um, so we, uh, our organization, some of our board members got to go to a conference put on by the International Society of Professional Trackers that was held here in Ooh. Oregon this year. And, Amazing. Um my one of my favorite well i would say my favorite tracking book authors tracking researchers were there at the conference including a guy named mark elbrock so if you want to mm-hmm. if you want to get inspired to learn about tracking check out his books they are super great they're really? they're really great yeah mark elbrock mark elbrock and he he told me that um they had found a den outside yosemite and it was just off the freeway, so that that he he was the one who first introduced me to the idea that wolverines might not be as shy as mm. we previously thought. If you look in all the older animal behavior books, they say they they say that wolverines are shy. But he just came up. Uh, Mark Elbrock just came up with a new mammals book um, that just came out, I believe, this year. But it might have been 2010. And he has a pretty awesome Wolverine chapter. <laughs> I, I've got to make a comment at, at this time. We, you, since you're talking about Wolverines, and I don't want to leave our wrestling fans out of this, oh. but there is, was a pro wrestler named Chris Benoit. He was always called the Rabid Wolverine. Really? Yeah, that That's was his, a lot. His, his wrestling name. Do you know him? Uh, well, just from watching him. Oh I've my watched gosh. a lot of him. Wolverines are like... They're not even afraid of a bear. Oh. They are, they're, they're, they're top of the food chain, and I think the only one that can really take them out is the human being. Oh. Well, the, the lore about wolverines gets pretty extreme, too, especially outdoor types like to kind of have, you know, fish stories, like they say, mm-hmm. and people will say that wolverine stories, a wolverine right? followed them for 50 miles and went to the door of their cabin and all this <laughs> stuff, you know? like And knocked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People introduced himself. There's some pretty good Wolverine stories out there. You know, we talk about Wolverine, and I don't know if they're if they're a Keystone or a indicator species or not. But we talked about these. But you know, tracking is a lot more than that. I mean, yeah. as we'll see in a clip in a little while, you, there there's the snow bunnies, and uh, we didn't have any mice. But there's there's all kinds of other animals too. And uh, what what is the uh, what is the purpose and and the uh, and the advantage of, of uh, being able to track those as well? Well, we, we kind of, we record all the animals and different ones have a different level of importance. So the prey species will generally just tally and that way we know if there's a lot of prey and not a lot of predators, that means something. Or if there's a lot, if there's predators, but very few prey, that means something. It might mean conditions, you know, like tracking is one of the things that we're, there's not that many things left where things ha- things are left as questions a lot. Mm -hmm. But it's much more than species, too. It's behavior. You can tell behavior by looking at the animal's tracks. Behavior meaning what? uh, What was that animal doing? You know, that, what, at that particular moment. At mean. that moment, right, right. yeah, where the tra- where the trail was left, and mm-hmm. sometimes if you get lucky, you can tell. We've seen animals make kills in the snow, um, that and that's oh. one of the reasons we do it in winter is so that we can we can have that snow down to leave those really clear tracks, so that mm-hmm. beginners and intermediate trackers can see more and kind of start to get more of the. We're, what we do when we're tracking sometimes is we get to build these stories of. First, the animal went over here, you know, it smelled that, and then it went over here, and that coyote marked its territory, and then it went on and ate a mouse or something, mm-hmm. you know? So it's it's a lot A beginner attitude can be what species is it, what mm-hmm. animal is it, and then you just say, oh, it's a snowshoe hare, it's a chicory, but... Um, the There's thermos. another level where you the you add it. You just um, got it. 
Mm -hmm. Sorry you, about breaking your chair. That's okay. <laughs> There's another level where you're, you're really thinking of the area and what's going on and building a story. Mm -hmm. And there's another level of tracking too, which is um, finding the animal, which we, it isn't our goal as an organization when we're out on surveys to, to actually trail. That's called trailing, but that's a whole skill so you mean, set. You mean track it, meaning right to where it's, you yeah. find it. Yeah, that's right. And we have some people, some of our trip leaders who really like to do that. That, that would be, you know, to me, the epitome of it in some ways. Some people think so, yeah. And there are tests now, so you can, if you're a really good tracker um, and you can you can trail animals, you can be certified. Mm -hmm. You take camera pictures. Of it. Does anybody in your group? Yeah, so um, when we are looking for our target <coughs> species, mm -hmm. especially if we see something kind of rare, the more evidence we can provide as to oh. how we know the identification of what species those tracks are, okay. the better. So we always have digital cameras with us. We have oh, GPS. Okay. So we take as much data as we possibly can. Not only do we take uh, still pictures, but we also draw. We draw, okay, we really? sketch the tracks, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say you drew, drew the animals. But, uh, no, no, yeah. We, we, sketch, we sketch the tracks that we can see. Okay. So. Well, it's a good thing you, you do because okay. videotaping those tracks, very seldom they come through. And even the photographs don't come through. Drawings really would give you the detail you need. Yeah. yeah. White on white. Yeah. It's right, new. exactly. And, yeah. and, uh, and then we, and then we, uh, we might see, and, and the, I put one picture there, uh, we st our longest talk was along a stretch, it was about 20, 30 feet long, of a, a, it wasn't just a track or two, it was a whole range of tracks, and you were able to read an awful lot about what was going on because of the consistency of the steps and the distance between them and all that. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, and, uh, and one of them was, I remember, they were the, it looked so much like a dog or a coyote, and there was ways that you can determine the difference just between those two. Both canine, but... Pattern. You were out for one day, so yeah, I'd say yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, I hope it won't be my only day. Oh, yeah. So let's, let's move into another role, and we got another clip here talking about, I think it was a little bit about um, uh, squirrels, and then, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was, it was deers rubbing up against trees and, and, and some of the behavior that uh, we can, we can uh, decipher from their activities. That's right. Looking is more than just looking at the animal tracks in the snow. This, looking at this pile of fur cone, or dug fur cones, lets me know that there's an active squirrel population. So that looks several that looks older than this year. So that means they live in this tree or they just use it for looking for predators or? I would assume that it's, they're living in this tree. Currently, if that was uh, pilings from last year, where they moved on, maybe? Depends if the nest made it through the, through the season. But I, I would, I usually assume that if they're going to nest in dug fur, it's going to be in a hollow, like an old woodpecker hole or something. In my experience, they seem to prefer the deciduous trees and build nests in those. What, more nooks and crannies or something? Yeah. So you say that's a deer rub? Because the, it's shredded both directions and if it, in my experience, if it's a bobcat or a mountain lion clawing, everything would be down low here. And I haven't seen I've never seen a cat scratch that did this much damage. Usually, usually it would be just marks in the tree, but there would be three or four of them. But that was probably left by a deer antler, a deer tine. And I've also noticed that deer seem to come back on a regular basis to the same clump of the same tree or the same clump of trees. So I think the the dead stuff 
My guess is it got the bark got rubbed off of it and then eventually killed it. They're rubbing the they rub two times a year. They rub to get the velvet off their mm, antlers, and then they rub during the breeding season for to, scent for territory to build up their neck muscles oh. to strengthen their neck muscles. Spar with something that isn't going to fight back. <laughs> Do uh, deer have territory scent leavings like dogs and coyotes and such, or is that completely different thing? I would imagine that they do, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. I know there was a study done recently with elk herds, and they found elk will get a harem of females together, and the big bull will defend his harem. But they found that most of the calves are being born to a satellite bull because a big bull is so busy chasing off the other males that they'll be younger <laughs> satellites. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll go in while the big one's chasing off his buddy. He's going over there having fun with a harem. <laughs> Slick Willie. <laughs> All right, well, we're done with Slick Willie here. All right, welcome back. Uh, we'll continue the conversation, and we got one more clip after this. we still got 20 minutes or so. That's great. Uh, anything you want to move on from what you saw there? Um, that was a sort of informal trip that we led with Bark just as an introduction to tracking, mm -hmm. but that if people are interested in getting involved, we have... Um, the Wolverine Tracking Project, which starts in fall, and you have to sign up at the beginning of the season, but we train you. Really? Yeah. So so you sign up, and then you get to go on trips, as many trips as you want after that. So you um, sign up in the autumn for the next year. Then. Yep. And, and all the trainings from scratch are in the beginning of the season, and then you're trained, so you can go out on surveys after that. Mm -hmm. And we started this year a program for people who want to learn tracking a little faster and it's called the intensive study program mm -hmm. and it's sort of in pilot phase right now but it's working out super great we have at least eight I think eight to ten people participating and they're normal participants but they their goal is to eventually become a trip leader so they're it's sort of almost like a tracking and naturalist like support group they're learning together these things that you need to know in order to be a pretty well-rounded naturalist so you can lead tracking trips. Mm -hmm. And um, if someone was motivated to learn faster, that would be a great thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. You know, what that, you mentioned it just right there. I mean, it isn't just being able to track an animal. This is, this is just an avenue into being a naturalist. Exactly. And, so many other, and there's so many other things that this leads into. In order to be a tracker, you must be a naturalist. You must know... The gen like I said, there are those levels. There's the level of looking at an individual print. There's the level of looking at the trail of the animal that you can see move on down the road. But then there's also the level of the entire ecology of the place. Mm -hmm. And any good hunter will tell you that. You know, anybody who tries to find animals will tell you you have to know what's going on in order to be good at mm -hmm. it. So. Well, what you're doing is you're is you're studying and establishing relationships. Yeah, and, th and that's really, I think that's one of the things that makes it so interesting is that it's super complex and you never can learn everything that there is to know. So every mm -hmm. time you go up there, you'll learn new things and you'll always come back with questions that remain unanswered. So, and that's, that's just really important and, and mm -hmm. super fun to do, especially because it's a group of people. We're a community at the same time. Yeah. And it's a nonprofit, and you're doing something good that adds to, it's a volunteer project, you know. Mm -hmm. So we've actually been able to give for the, forest service, the Forest Service data so that they can manage Mount Hood better. Right. And we are a very humble organization, I might point out. <laughs> uh, it, it's all volunteer run, supported by member donations, very humble. Like, even our director is a volunteer, and she works her butt off. Mm -hmm. so, Who is the director? Uh, our director's name is Terry Lysak, and mm -hmm. she, right now, she's studying foxes on Mount Adams, but um, she uh, is a forester, and she was on the board and kind of stepped up when we needed somebody, so she's been keeping it together for a couple years now. Mm -hmm. We're super proud of her. Is Mink 
one of these yeah cabinets? yeah you know, we have me because I knew I thought of it because of all the past history of everybody getting into breeding minks and then it just kind of went by the wayside. Yeah, mink are native and they're actually one of, they're in that mustelid family. They're mm. in the weasel family. Oh, okay. So, and we, yeah. we see mink tracks sometimes. Do, do these so animals right. tend to go, stop coming where humans have been? Is that something? Not necessarily. Okay. Animals will be shy, but it seems like, and certain animals can adapt better to our presence, our impact. Yeah. And there are certain types of impacts that animals can't adjust to, um, ex except the animals that are associated with us, like crows and raccoons oh. and rats and things like that. That's us. Yeah, so, so, but there are animals that can exist. As long as there's a little bit of forest left, there are some animals that can exist there. Okay. And you'd be okay. surprised to, if you, once you start learning tracking, you really start to see where animals are that you didn't really realize they were passing by, like elk in Forest Park, for example, or deer right. in urban Portland, or coyotes even. They're there. Yeah, and, Keep... and uh, that we're seeing coyotes more, but I was pretty surprised to see deer in my dad's backyard recently. <laughs> oh. Deer tracks, I should say. <laughs> yeah, tracks. <laughs> so you're out in the forest and you find this, this uh, footprint. Yeah. It's clear, you know what it is. And then next is to see if there's another one. Now, what can you determine between these relationships? I think gate was the word you right. used for one of them. So the way we teach tracking, I could sort of give a, a, a quick here. summary. <laughs> yeah, 101. Yeah, you want me to? Yeah, sure. Um, so generally when you approach a track, you look at the trail first and you look at the gate and different types of animals have different ways of moving like bears tend to walk really wide they're they're pretty you know big animals so their tracks are going to be really big and they don't step they don't usually don't step in their own tracks and um where mm. compared to a deer they tend to walk right in they do something we call direct register walk or diagonal walk which is where they step in their own track. Their front track falls, their front left track falls, and then their front, or their rear left, their, excuse me, their front left track makes a print, and then their rear left foot hits Follows in the same them. spot. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we call a direct register, and that's, humans are direct register. When we crawl, we tend to make prints like that. But coyotes are also that, and most, and our big cats are as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that they always walk like that. So you look at the trail and you say, is this the baseline of any animal that I know? What's going on? You kind of look at it from this like 10 foot away, 5 foot away range. Mm -hmm. And then the next level is you get closer and you look at the individual prints. You count toes. How many toes are there? How, whether there are claws. And those are all things that can help us, you know, refine... And, you know, it might be bird tracks. You don't know. you got to take a look. So, mm -hmm. And you can gauge the speed of the animal? Depending on the gait, generally you mm -hmm. can, especially in snow because snow is a little more 3D. Um, but, yeah, you can, you can gauge speed pretty easily. Because even though you say, I forget the term you use, but an animal will have a specific uh, way it walks. Yeah, it's called the baseline Baseline, gait. right. But, uh -huh. you know, under, under, under stressful situations or, you know, they're being predated or chasing something that can change so you can determine mm -hmm. the the uh the gate the, the difference in gate like they may be bounding after something or because mm -hmm. there was different gates you mentioned there was what hopping and and depending on that, that type of animal right so there there are a few baseline gates but then every animal will go outside of that for various reasons like even if they're going up or down hill their gait will change mm -hmm. so it's not even always that they're scared or chasing something but um, they might have smelled an interesting smell and they're pausing or they're turning or mm -hmm. their feet will just fall in a different pattern. And generally, if you follow an animal's trail enough, you can see the gait change. And so if you see an unusual set of tracks that's not the baseline of an animal, sometimes you can follow it until it gets more regular. And then, so then what we do when we're out on our, um, our surveys is we take data, we measure, we measure the individual footprints we measure in between the tracks, which is called stride. So like the, the front track to the same print, the same part of the same print. 
So that's stride, like in between a person's foot, you would measure from the back of their left foot so to the back of their next left foot. It's a complete right. revolution of all four steps. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. And then we'll also measure something called straddle, which is the width. And oh, okay. when you look up a, an animal in a tracking book, it'll give you all that data. Mm -hmm. So that's how we will confirm or, you know, usually we're leading participants who are new, intermediate or beginners at, at learning animal tracking. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll have our, our books out and we'll have our tape measures out and uh, it's pretty fun. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not the most riveting part, but that's also really key to making sure that what we're seeing and what we're saying that it is, is exactly what it is. Well, sometimes you have to finesse it like that in order to determine anything at all. And there are lots of times where we can't say 100% for sure, but we try to get as close as we can. Oh, well, was it you said that an amateur will say it's this, and somebody that, that knows a lot will say, I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> someone was saying they observed that on the bark trip, that mm -hmm. the, the experienced trackers wouldn't necessarily just dismiss, say, oh, that's a snowshoe hare. They would look at it. For a while first and mm -hmm. and that's something i've observed as well observed as well right well, this well, is all something that you know most people aren't thinking about it just opens right. up a whole different world whole, right whole different world and that's one of the reasons that i love tracking is because um no matter where you are you can practice it um things leave marks and you always ask questions of what happened here you know learning mm -hmm. about what what type of how to get information out of car tire tracks, how to get information out of people's footprints. Mm -hmm. People are really fun to track if you're an animal tracker because our feet are so big, a lot more information gets transferred to them. Mm -hmm. So you can see supposedly, and I haven't done the, too much of this myself, you can see uh, where their head is turning, what their body's doing from looking at their feet, oh. mm -hmm. looking at the tracks of, of a person. And there's so much you can learn from one track. I, I know I asked you when we were out there, uh, probably showing my ignorance a little bit, but we're out there to learn, you know, the difference between a deer track and an elk track, which other than the size, you know, right. just like with a wolf and a fox, say, right. that there are ways. Oh, yeah, deer and elk, you know, depending on the substrate, like the material that the track was left in, mm -hmm. it can be tricky if it's snow and it's been melting and thawing, like that's what we saw up there. Right. But um, deer and elk tracks are pretty different. Generally, elk tracks are more rounded in the front, more oval shaped. And deer tracks are, each toe is really pointy at the tip, so they're like teardrops. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a that's just a rule of thumb that you can take with you. Right. But if you're now that you're hooked, you better get you a tracking <laughs> yeah. book, right? Yeah, learn a little bit more about just, it. Yeah, just take it with you when you're out in the mm -hmm. woods, and that way you can, or remember your questions even better, right. and bring it home and look it up, because right. you'll it's, remember it even better then. It's getting to the point now, a person could walk out in the woods with a mushroom book, and a plant book, and a tree yeah. book, and next thing you know, oh, you're burdened yeah. with all these books. Uh, so, well, we're down to a little under, little under, right around eight minutes, and uh, like like I said, there was a bunch of us, I think uh, they were hoping to get a dozen people, 26 people showed up, including the, 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 the leaders of the groups, but there was still a good 20 people that went on the hike and at the very end we uh actually grady asked he's who's the bark uh hike leader component of this asked everybody to give a little bit of what their impression or something stuck in their mind for the day and then this is the last clip this is another about three minute clip and just let people know who people have done some hiking and tracking and some that hadn't so it's just kind of broad spectrum of experience here we just love it to hear from everyone what was your story for today or what was it that captivated you, or whatever you would like? Well, I enjoyed learning about tracking. Um, I like this sort of imaginary sculpting of the animal uh, from the tracks. So that was pretty. That was pretty cool. Definitely. Um, yes, this is my first time tracking, and I think the first time I saw a track on my own, I was like, I think that's a deer track. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I also really liked the conjuring of the animal with the hands. I thought that was amazing. And uh, I also just like to hear, you know, some of the more complicated things about how you're going about it or, like, how you can determine what it was doing and how big it was and all that. It's pretty, pretty impressive. So. Mine's really basic and stupid, but I learned that I've been thinking that deer tracks go the wrong direction my entire life. And so that actually, in a weird way, like, helps me, like, put together a narrative about tracks in a way that I've just been getting wrong my whole life, so I mean, <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's really basic. Uh, I just liked having the chance to get back up on the mountain again because it's been a while since I've done anything really outside. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I agree with that. It's been a long time. Um, and hiking on snow is something I've never done before. Um, and being able to identify tracks and just get a feel for tracking is really special. Um, I think I like everything about it. It's the first time that I've done tracking, and I don't think it's going to be the last. It was super exciting. And my most favorite tracks I found it were something. That's another thing I realized that you can't say these were these. You know, it's like the novice says these were these tracks, and the experienced people say, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but we saw a bunch of deer tracks kind of all over each other, and um, Trevor's hypothesis was deer's mating. Tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> I think it's added a, a kind of another dimension to hiking in the woods. You know, I usually I'm looking at plants and looking for mushrooms and mm. looking for live animals. So now I'm looking for animals that have passed by and it's mm -hmm. a nice way to know they're there. Cool. Um, for me, being up here with other people, like part of tracking is that there's stories and these are this activity is something that we do but if we don't share it it's a lot less special and so I'm, I feel really just tickled to have such a big group here to have bark out here interested in tracking and to see so much natural observation ability that people are making these really good guesses straight out of the gate with almost no experience at all so good job y'all <laughs> i'm thankful for everybody's enthusiasm today it's awesome um, i love that people are out asking questions making guesses i mean it helps i'm still still a novice tracker so it's helping me me learn and it was just an amazing day thanks everybody I like the uh, questioning everybody did of all the tracks and just uh, really makes them more interactive and has the stories come out. So I'm really thankful that everybody was like questioning and into it. So I like the fact that you have to be, when you're looking for tracks, you really have to pay attention to your surroundings and like what's going on and not stepping on them. So I think I will permanently have imprinted on my memory how beautiful the little squirrel tracks were. Mm -hmm. That was probably my favorite part. And um, so yeah, thank you everybody. And I also just loved learning the technical details. Like, that was really great. It was a great chance to get my dog to try to um, behave. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, being in the forest and the clean air. It's wonderful. I really like what Leila said about how it's like looking back in time. It's, it's like traveling and seeing this other story that unfolded right where you are. You know, we, we watch these TV programs that talk about stars, the light left a million years ago and we're just now seeing it. Well, you know, we're playing with time travel here too as well. I never thought yeah. of it that way before. That was great. So we got about a little three and a half minutes. So, you know, you wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about your organization. Yeah, so Cascadia Wild is a nonprofit, and we teach um, survival skills and what's called primitive skills. Some people say that, mm -hmm. um, and so that includes like outdoor survival, edible plants, um, plant ID, like botany, but also making fire with no matches, like mm -hmm. like using uh, just your hand and some sticks or a bow drill, what we call a bow drill, oh. um, and we have classes on that. Uh, we have all classes on orienteering, so if people are interested in that general stuff, um, feel free to check out our website. We'll have classes uh, all through the summer. A lot of them are f inexpensive or free. They're all oh. inexpensive or free um, because we are volunteers, and the reason we're involved is that we really want to share these things with other people. Mm -hmm. So um, making the fire that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. It's really it's you feel like a superhero when, when you, you get your fire rub going. sticks together oh, and you yeah. come up with a coal and you make you make a little bundle and you blow and flames come out. Yeah, oh, just making yeah. fire with nothing. Uh -huh. um, and you feel like a superhero when you do a lot of this stuff, including oh, okay. tracking. Like mm -hmm. you get to travel through time in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. So check us out uh, CascadiaWild.org or info at CascadiaWild.org. And also, uh, just if you're on Facebook, like you were saying, yeah. you're, you're not a, you don't have a Facebook page. Well, no, I, 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 I oh, want to. I'm not familiar enough with it, but that I want some ideas on how to get to it. Right. So. so you just go to Facebook, and if you already have a your own page, you just click in uh, Cascadia Wild across the top in that little box, and it'll take you right to your page. 
oh. and that gives us about a little about a minute and a half. Uh, there's so much to learn out there, and like you say, you know, you're kind of like in a large cave with a small flashlight. Yeah. No matter what you see, it always points to more. But ha having that mystery is one of the things that really keeps me going, mm -hmm. is always uh, having questions that you can keep asking um, to feel like everything is explained when you look at something and you say, oh, that's that, and just forget about it. Like, mm -hmm. how boring would that be? Yeah. So you always want to have those questions that make you curious enough to keep going forward you I know i think that might be a good explanation to the difference between work and play you know, <laughs> if everything's explained then it's work but if it's you know if you can get out there and play with it and every question every question you answer gives you an, at least one more question then you know that's then is then then it is that is as dynamic as the forest is itself right and and as we are mm -hmm. we're we're an extension of that we're complicated just like the the ecology is so mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we we tend to talk about ourselves as if we're other than that, but we're not. We're we're part exactly. of it. And that's a that's a good, very good point to end it on. I know that uh, you always want to. I want to thank the crew because we wouldn't be doing this without their help. They did an exceptional job tonight fixing that uh, fixing the, uh, the VTR that went out. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week, next month, I should say, the second Wednesday of every month.